So uh, the next panel is bringing together sector-based and community-based perspectives on the cascading impacts of drought. So it is my pleasure to introduce the next set of panelists. Um, first up, we will have Terry Fankhauser, who is the Executive Vice President of the Colorado Cattlemen's Association. Next is Deanna Ikea, who is a Senior Water Policy Analyst at the Central Arizona Project, or CAP, and she focuses on implementing policies and programs to protect and enhance the project's Colorado River water supply. And then we will be rounded out with Bitta Becker. Bitta is currently serving as an associate attorney for the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority. She also serves on the leadership team for the Water and Tribes Initiative in the Colorado River Basin, co-leading the universal access to clean water for tribal communities um, on the New Mexico Interstate Stream Commission and on the Navajo Nation Water Rights Commission. So quite a, a group of panelists to hear from. I'm gonna go ahead, um, remind you all again that following a bit of Becker's presentation, we'll be taking a few questions. So continue to put your questions into the questions box. Um, so first off, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Terry Fankhauser, Terry. If you want to go ahead and turn on your camera and unmute yourself. Great. My name is Terry Fankhauser. As indicated, I'm with the Colorado Cattlemen's Association. I've uh, been with the organization, I guess I could say in years or I could say in cycles of drought um, as, as we've moved through this. I'm going to use sort of uh, Colorado as an example for talking more broadly about the Southwest and then agriculture as an example to talk more broadly about a variety of industries. Um, obviously, we focus on water as, as sort of the direct implications and lack of availability uh, due to drought, but there are associated issues as well. So move to the next slide. As I indicated, um, you know, the, this, this a lot is from our Department of Natural Resources, but I think it's very applicable. Um, we continue to face evolving impacts from a multi-year severe drought episode. And drought, of course, is part of the normal cycle, as, as we've learned from other speakers, and, and I believe most of us understand very clearly, it seems to be increasing and, and it continues to reveal that droughts of the past are not the same as the droughts of the future. Uh, in Colorado, that's been one of the evolving sort of notions and mindsets that has created a more broad spectrum uh, planning approach um, and, and really trying to reach toward a marker of resiliency. So we have a number of things that are set up in the state. And the reason I'm gonna use Colorado as an example, I do believe, and I'll, I'll, I'll begin with this, I believe that consistency of approach, um, a solid database of information. Um, and uh, while we may not agree, agree entirely on how we address response or what the response is or what ultimately resiliency looks like, because we have to maintain that, in order to have industries and communities persevere, we do we do need to look through uh, a bit of a consistent lens. So in Colorado, how we've sort of dealt with this is through our state drought response task force. I've been on a number of these throughout the year. Um, within these response task forces, we have a number of individualized working groups or, or sub task forces, if you will. We have a water availability task force that continues to be mon monthly because obviously, you know, the provisioning of water both within state and along specifically the Colorado River and the upper and lower basins is something that is very real and prevalent as a result of drought and is, is, is and could be its own entire topic of discussion. Um, and then we break that down further into agriculture, energy, municipal and wildlife. And each one of these task forces dig deeply into um, uh, the, and, and during the activated plan, but they dig deeply into 
um, aspects of response and driving toward a better sense of resiliency, predictability, things along those lines. And as I said, we all work under the same auspices and general understanding that droughts are changing. They're more severe and they're more impactful in and of themselves, but also uh, as a multiplier over time. So we'll switch slides again. I don't know if I clicked on some, there we go. Just a little delay. Uh, this may seem biased from my background and perspective, but I'll get to an economic component that 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 we've uh, we've really modeled that sort of indicates why the statement that agriculture communities bear the brunt of a drying landscape um, and that investment in that food supply and rural resilience is important. And this is one of the things Colorado has has really begun to focus on because um, food production obviously is a is a requirement of life. Um, a great deal of our water availability goes to that of food production. And as we see these increased droughts, uh, we start to see those impacts to those food producing communities uh, and, and, and all associated industries uh, and, and society become increasingly more uh, impacted. So just a few background points. 2020 is the first time since 2012 that Colorado experienced a statewide or 100% drought. Um, severe drought has, has uh, taken place. And I just look back sort of through my 20 some year tenure and look to see how many um, actually declared and designated droughts had taken place. And we, we've, we've had that happen in 2020, or 2002, 2012, 2018, and now, of course, in 2021. A lot of our drought has been centered in the southeast part of the state, but this year, uh, obviously, um, our western slope um, has really been impacted uh, very significantly, as was a year ago uh, with, with strong drought. Uh, monsoon seasons were absent. Uh, as you all know, we had record high temperatures, low snowfalls, uh, winds, ultra low humidity, dust contributes to snowpack melt early, and then ultimately the element of fire and wildfire on the landscape is being a resulting aspects as well as causative aspects of, of, of drought. Um, we've had record wildfire seasons, as have many uh, states in the West. Those are very impactful and they have a multiplier effect on, on water systems and supplies due to uh, sedimentation and things like that coming with those storm events following that severe drought or se severe wildfire. And we see tremendous impacts to local communities uh, from that to the to the wildlife, to the naturally functioning resource. Uh, in some cases, having to fully reconstruct irrigation infra infrastructure, and then ultimately way, uh, water treatment facilities. So it becomes very very expensive as you as you continue to add the multipliers of drought moving forward. So we've tried to analyze what those impacts are, and we have a, a good amount of information uh, that's been anal analyzed within the state. Um, but if we continue to see the pace at which we see drought and the, and the increasing impacts of drought, as we've seen throughout our recent past, by 2050, it's estimated that drought may cost Colorado an additional $830 million in annual damages. And of that, $511 million will come from ag alone. And uh, I can't imagine what those numbers, if we were to analyze those systematically throughout the Southwest, how significant and large that number might be. Um, but as you can see, that's a tremendous amount of, of impact from drought alone uh, in, in one state of many. Move to the next slide here. I think we had something pop out of order. There we go. So as we look and analyze what a response to drought looks like, because that's really the focus of these drought task forces, 
we start to look at different resource bases and try to understand what exists out there. And I think this goes to my message of consistency and understanding um, because we have to be able to respond in a, in a way that has meaning. So declarations, as we all know, come into play traditionally uh, from public agencies at varying levels um and 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 varying levels of government they mean certain things to certain sectors of business um they're very basic in in a lot of sense and they're not intended to solve all of the problems that exist so we need what we learn from that and what we understand is is that industries alone also need to step forward and engage in in whatever a response might look like we can't solely depend on you know, an agency response to to drought. Uh, there is, uh, though, typically significant and far-reaching technical assistance that we can capitalize on in the case of drought. A number of agencies within agriculture, but certainly across other business sectors, tend to provide technical assistance uh, and information and uh, um, people power. Funding, um, funding. We, we've compiled a list of state and national funding in Colorado just to look at it through the lens of, of agriculture. Uh, I believe that each sector that I mentioned before has done that. It is linked in this presentation. If those are made available later, I'm not going to go to that now. But I think that's important that we all have, a con again, a consistent understanding of what is available what those funding resources can contribute to and what they don't, more importantly, what they don't contrib contribute to. Uh, okay. And then programming. And that's where I believe uh, states have a tremendous role to play. And, and I really do appreciate and like the structure that's been implemented in Colorado related to drought response programming. Um, it's been consistent over the years. It varies a little bit. Uh, year over year, but for us to systematically respond to drought, it's important that we have this opportunity in front of us. I always bring this up because because individuals believe that there's some more broad, significant response to drought as there is wildfire uh, from the federal government, but presidential drought emergency declarations are possible, but they're extremely rare. They're made available through the Stafford Act. If you wanna, if you wanna dig into that, um, as they're defined as a natural catastrophe. More to, I believe there's only two instances in history where a drought in a certain area has been allowed to be designated through a presidential declaration. Uh, in most cases, those have been denied. So that's important to understand what the extent and the length of that is. Hey, Terry, I pardon yeah. the interruption. You have two minutes left. Thanks. Perfect. States should have a drought plan. I think those need to be coordinated and monitored. Um, there needs to be some sort of response situation due to drought and mitigation for, on short and long-term levels. I'm gonna reference in the next slide, I believe just a couple of things and then uh, if I can get it to tra transition. Again, I mentioned resiliency, so let's just flip to the next slide. Colorado has um, modeled a number of, uh, this is partially, you can see here, some of the resiliency metrics that agriculture is trying to put in place to assist with drought, uh, as well as climate issues in the state. Currently, the industry sector that I'm from has about 1.9% of the greenhouse gas emission uh, components, and we're ever increasing that going toward a climate neutrality. We'll switch to the next slide. I'm gonna point two websites out to you. And I would uh, I would encourage you to take a look at both of these. One's a visualization, a visualization story about drought and the impacts of drought. And then the other goes into future avoided costs and exploring what those look like and what sort of actions be taken. These are very important because communicating drought in a way that's understood to the community at large is something that we don't spend a lot of time on. This does that through industry sectors. The last slide available speaks to some of the recommendations that were made uh, through Colorado. I'm going to leave you to read those and the proceeds from, from this presentation, but 
my experience as we've moved through with my industry segment in this state indicates that we need a really strong local to regional coordinated um, uh, process and regional meaning uh, regional in the United States, but we need to be consistent in our approach year over year. And uh, um, that's the one thing that I think that we look for as we look beyond our geographic borders or beyond our industries is the way to consistently approach and address a more resilient response to drought. So with that, I'll yield and uh, appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Terry. And I'm looking, I'm hoping that you're gonna be able to join um, the panels on the next couple of days to talk a little bit more about these recommendations. There's some really interesting forward thinking um, ideas here. So next up, um, thanks again, Terry. Next up, we're gonna hear from Deanna Ikea from the Central Arizona Project. Deanna? Hi there, thanks for having me. I'm going to uh, start out with the next slide uh, by just going over a, a brief overview of the Central Arizona Project, uh, the CAP, so that you can have a little bit of perspective of our focus and issues and also do um, a little bit of orientation of the Colorado River, which is the sole source of water for the CAP. So just looking big picture wise, you'll see Lake Powell as the blue body of water up at the northern central border of Arizona which then flows down through the Grand Canyon to Lake Mead, which is on the western, northwestern tip there of Arizona. Then it flows down uh, south from there along the western border of Arizona, which is also the border with California. And then it flows on south to Mexico. And you'll see the black line that cuts through Arizona there, that is the CAP Canal. So it, we take out at Lake Havasu, we deliver the water over a 336 mile canal and deliver that water over to the Phoenix area and south to through the Tucson area. So this engineering marvel um, actually goes under 10, uh, goes through 10 siphons, which takes the canal under major riverbeds and also major highways. And it also tunnels through four mountains. We also operate Lake Pleasant, which is located about halfway across on the canal. And this, uh, this reservoir helps us to manage our water deliveries as well as our power usage. We deliver about 500 million gallons on an average year or about 1.4 million acre feet to about 60 customers. Those customers include municip municipal water users, tribal contracts, and agriculture. And in recent years, um, we've made contributions to Lake Mead. And um, so those deliveries are actually not deliveries where we leave that water in Lake Mead. And when I say 60 customers, like one of those customers could be the city of Phoenix, where they then take a delivery of CAP water, treat it for drinking water purposes, and then deliver it through their distribution system to customers like, like myself. So in order to deliver this water, um, looking at the next slide, we'll look at um, one of the major components, which is that we need a lot of power in order to deliver this water. We have to lift that water nearly 3,000 feet uphill in order to deliver it. It's run through 14 pumping plants. The water is lifted by a pumping plant. The very first one actually has the largest lift of about 800 feet. Um, we lift it up, it flows down by gravity over several miles, and then it's lifted up by the next, uh, by the next pumping plant. So in order to do all that pumping, um, we use a lot of power. So about 2.5 million megawatt hours each year. So that makes us Arizona's largest energy user. So by delivering the water to Arizona's two largest municipal areas, the Phoenix and Tucson area, we serve nearly 80% of Arizona's population. And also we deliver to a large agricultural area that's located between Phoenix and Tucson. And that represents about 40% of the state's agriculture. So this water supports over $100 billion of, of Arizona's economy. Next, please. In order to, to meet those energy needs, the CAP continues to utilize energy markets, both long-term and short-term. And that complements our long-term resources, which includes Hoover power, solar, and Salt River project power. Um, we will also be seeking additional long-term resources in the coming years that could include other renewable supplies and natural gas resources. The system configuration of the CAP helps to manage our power needs. So you remember I mentioned Lake Pleasant, 
um, we pump from the Colorado River and, and hold it in Lake Pleasant, and we pump that during the winter when the overall energy costs are higher. And then we deliver from Lake Pleasant to the majority of our water users in the Phoenix and Tucson areas during the summer when we can actually generate power from the new Waddell Dam that uh, creates Lake Pleasant. And we can uh, use the power resources from that as well as make deliveries. And also the staff manages our power purchases to minimize our power costs. So for instance, when there was that ice storm event in Texas, uh, we were able to sell some of our, our power resources uh, during that time um, and not use as much and sell it to those who, who did need it. So our main power source used to be the Navajo Generating Station. However, that was decommissioned in 2019 in order to meet very aggressive carbon-free goals. So one of the major challenges in meeting our energy needs uh, will be uh, finding other sources to meet those base load uh, needs. Uh, renewable resources such as uh, solar can't meet the energy needs during extreme conditions. So we will need to still rely on uh, sources such as natural gas, coal, and, and nuclear to meet those baseload requirements. So power is, uh, we, and we do use some of the hydropower, um, as you saw as uh, um, Hoover, Hoover Dam power being one of our resources that is a Colorado River hydropower supply. And so power is uh, definitely of importance to the CAP, but also obviously the water supply. So next slide, please. The Colorado River is a water resource to seven states in the US, as well as to Mexico, serving over 40 million people. And you all probably have seen us in the headlines lately uh, with the release of a report, specifically with the release of a report in August that called out that we will be in shortage operations for Lake Mead in 2022. So I need to dive a little bit into some of the background of Colorado River operations in order to understand our operations and where we are now. So the Colorado River is governed by compacts, treaties, court decrees, and agreements that span back all the way to 1922. Currently, Lakes Mead and Powell are operated in a coordinated way, and this was negotiated and agreed upon in the 2007 guidelines. And I'll talk about that one a little bit in, in a, other slides. Um, so water that is released from Glen Canyon Dam, so Lake Powell, the, that volume is specified in what's called this 24-month study. And the, the graph that you see there is the result of the August 24-month study. And this, this study is a report that shows projections of reservoir conditions over the next two years. And that model relies on initialization with current reservoir conditions, as well as using current short-term temperature and precipitation forecasts to determine what our next 24 months might look like. So Diana, every month, yes. So just a time check, you have roughly two minutes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, so much to talk about. I will, I will skim through this. The important point I'd like to say here is that um, you'll see the wide ranging uh, possibilities um, of what might be the, the reservoir elevations in Lake Powell. Um, and you'll see in the minimum probable case, which is the yellow line, um, you'll see that, um, and so that represents um, 90, 90th, uh, the 90th percentile, that 90% of, um, of the scenarios run to come up with this um, are higher than that. So this is obviously the low, um, that we're dipping below the minimum power pool um, elevation in 2023. Um, and so uh, that also impacts not only just the power generation, but things, pro, uh, programs such as the salinity control program and a fish recovery program um, in the upper basin. And I would also like to point out that while hydropower is an important resource on the Colorado River, um, the dams that create Lake Powell and Mead were authorized first for flood control, then water supply, and then uh, for hydropower. Next slide, please. So then this is also the 24-month study results of Lake Mead. And what this just shows is that um, the projections for Lake Mead are below the gold dashed line, which is the, tier, the first tier of shortage of 1075, and that's projected at the end of 2021. So therefore, that's why we will be operating in shortage conditions in 2022. And you'll see our projections looking forward is that those look even lower um, at the end of 2022, uh, meaning that we could be at the next level of shortage by 2023. 
Um, the minimum power pool at Lake Mead is 950 feet, so we are not quite at that level yet, but of course that is still um, of a concern to us. I'll just skim to the next slide, please. Um, what I wanted to say is that with projections like this and, and what we've been hearing all morning, what are we doing on the Colorado River? Um, what this shows is the elevation of Lake Mead starting in 2000 up to the current time. And the blue boxes on top are the timings of the implementation of major agreements on the river. Um, I don't have time to go into all of those, but what you can see is that we've been, we've been working and doing a lot of things cooperatively throughout the basin. Um, each of those blue boxes represent a lot of work by a lot of people. Um, those agreements take months, if not years, of negotiations to get to yes. Um, and each of those um, agreements shown there change the operations of the river and then thus the outcomes of the elevations. The green boxes are also some important programs that were put in place. And um, as you can see before the green boxes, you'll see the precipitous decline of Lake Mead um, starting in the 2000s. But we implemented some programs that as you can see, um, kind of flattened the curve there a little bit and we've been kind of hovering over that red line which was that first tier of shortage and that pilot system conservation program and the lower basin uh, reservoir protection MOU actually laid some of the foundation for that last agreement box shown the drought contingency plan um, so next slide please we yeah, are out in time so if you want to um, wrap it up that would be great thanks okay what i'd like to say here is that the so this is just a diagram of the dcp um it involved a lot of parties the u.s federal government seven states and two countries the u.s and mexico um it took a lot of work to get this done next slide I just want to say that it impacted, the DCP impacted Arizona the most because the priority of CAP, we are the lowest priority on the Colorado River system. And so therefore it impacted us the most. And in order to get DCP passed in Arizona, um, we had to we had to get some mitigation components in place. We had to identify the resources to provide that. And also there was an additional offset component, which I can't go into right now. Um, but in other words, it took 11 agreements in just Arizona alone to get DCP passed in Arizona. And next slide, please. Um, in addition to negotiating um, discussions on the river, we've done a lot of drought adaptation actions at the CAP itself. We have a climate adaptation plan. We participate in research and the development and use of emerging data. And we are partnering with other utilities to, uh, to better adapt to what this new environment might be. So we are definitely reliant on precipitation and temperature that occurs in the Colorado River Basin, but also on the forecast and the work that's being done uh, by folks um, here attending attending this and working on the things that you all talked about this morning. Um, so we appreciate the work done by NOAA and, and others, and we are uh, depending on you for a lot of our data moving forward. Thanks. Thanks so much. That presentation was full of great information. Appreciate it. Don't go too far because we will have a QA. and a um, Great. Thank you so much, Deanna. Next up, we're going to hear from Bitta Becker uh, from the Navajo Nation. Bitta? If you are talking, we can't hear you, but I think mic is off because I can hear some rustling. Oh, shoot. Um, all right, give us one second. Bitta, you say you are speaking. We still can't hear you. Um, oh. Viva, she just needs to unmute herself. So I'm Bitta, done. there. Oh, is that you, Bitta? Yes, I apologize. And I oh, apologize. no worries. <laughs> no problem. Did you want to uh, turn your camera on or did you want to leave it off? Okay, my camera is on. That's what threw me. Okay. Um, I, I'm, it's showing a blood. I don't know why. I apologize. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Let's go ahead and, and get started with your presentation. And I'm happy to reduce time to, to make up for anything. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't worry about it. We've, we'll make up for it. Don't worry about it. Please, yeah, continue with your whole presentation. Okay, well, I, again, thank you. I wanted to start by thanking you for allowing me to join this presentation. Um, the, the way I titled this presentation was Navajo Nation at the Heart of All Things Drought. 
So what I, I only have two slides. I, I'm not a technical person. I've been very impressed with the previous presentations. Um, but you can see the Navajo Nation right in the center of the Colorado River Basin, upper and lower basin. And I chose this map because it highlights some of the other tribes that are in the Colorado River Basin. So I don't wanna forget the sister tribes that are out there um, dealing with the same issues that we're talking about today. In addition to these 10 tribes that you see, there are uh, 20 other federally recognized tribes, 20 other tribes. What this map doesn't show is all of the tribes around Phoenix. Um, when Deanne was talking about the DCP, I, I do want to recognize the Gila River tribe down by Phoenix and the Colorado River Indian tribes who were very much part of those DCP conversations. So I think that's probably the first point I'm trying to make, which is that um, not only are these conversations, as Deanne pointed out, um, lengthy, um, uh, challenging, they also need to be, they need to include voices uh, such as the tribal voices that have historically not always been part of some of these conversations concerning water management issues. Um, but it's very encouraging that these two tribes were heavily involved in the DCP conversations. So if you're interested in learning more about tribes, specifically in the Colorado Basin, I realize this webinar is about more than that. I really encourage you to check out that, um, that link that I have posted. It's to a Bureau of Reclamation report that was issued in 2019 that uh, was followed the heels of the Colorado River Basin report. And this report was focused on, the, on tribes and the water supply that, uh, the Colorado River Basin water supply as it relates to these 10 tribes that you see. Is that it's estimated that these 10 tribes have um, rights to about 20% of the Colorado River supply. So let me stop there and move on to Navajo Nation uh, focused uh, discussion, which is the next slide. And again, I apologize for the map, um, but I chose this one because it is a map showing the waters of the Navajo Nation is the way we like to describe it. And you can find this online so that, and I post the link that you, where you can find it so that you can get a better version of it. Um, but the blue lines are waters of the Navajo Nation. So, but how does this all relate to drought? I'm gonna start, at, well, let me back up and say, it, you know, the Navajo Nation is a sovereign entity. It's about the size of West Virginia in land mass. We have over 300,000 what are called members and over half of those members, 175 to 200,000 live on the, on the reservation. And as I started with, we are at the heart of all things drought. Um, the last time I spoke to Noah a couple months ago, um, the Navajo Nation, uh, the, all of the Navajo Nation was in severe to exceptional drought conditions. When I checked last night, I'm happy to report that we are no longer in severe drought location um, status, I mean, exceptional drought location. We, but all of the Navajo Nation is in uh, some form of drought. At the beginning of the year, 75% of the Navajo Nation was in exceptional drought, 75%. And we have been dealing with drought for many years now. We are very much in the epicenter of, of what's happening with this mega drought. So what does it mean for the people? And that's what I think I can bring to this conversation is how does drought affect life on the Navajo Nation? As many of you know, um, about, well, too many of our people lack access to clean drinking water in their homes. So it's estimated that 30 to 40% of the homes in the Navajo Nation lack clean drinking water. That means we have people who go to water hauling stations, including some operate in, uh, and maintained by the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority, wh where I work. Um, over the summer, one of those water hauling stations, um, the, we had it was pulling too much groundwater to too much water out of its groundwater supply and 
it was not the clean drinking water water haulers that were pulling that water it was our ranchers so our ranchers were feel, very much feeling the drought it was impacting their livestock so they were they started to haul clean drinking water which is not necessarily required for livestock um, but they were starting to pull that that water from one of our water hauling stations well that had the effect of threatening one of our community water systems so i'm just pointing out how our 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 systems here how interconnected they are so that where you know in some communities in the united states a uh, drought would affect your ranchers and your municipal water supply would never feel it right your city would never know that the ranchers were um were were being affected by drought but here are our, our people pull, turning on their taps in, in at least one community was feeling that effect of the drought. Um, so let me move to the, uh, let me move from the water hauling to just recreation. You can kind of see Lake Powell, and I'm, I'm non-technical, I'm a lawyer, because I'm gonna say in the upper left-hand corner, instead of giving you the directions, but I guess that's the Northwest corner, you can see Lake Powell. And every, I'm sure everybody on this webinar knows what's happening at Lake Powell. What people may not know is we have a developed recreational uh, tourism economy based around Lake Powell. So the drought that's affecting the natural system is also affecting parts of our economy. Um, just wanna underscore what Deanne said about hydropower. And I heard your point that, you know, the dams were created first for flood control. I I think in some ways the hydropower issue may be the most fascinating, meaning um, one, it's carbon free, and that's very important in this day and age. But as an equity issue, um, the majority of power that the Navajo Nation, that NTUA, the Navajo Tribal Utility Authority, I should be specific here, uh, uh, purchases for use on the Navajo Nation comes from the Colorado River system and Hoover Dam. And this power is some of the cheap, or is the cheapest power in the Southwest. So as these power supplies are threatened, what also becomes threatened is the, the ultimate cost to users who arguably cannot afford higher cost power. Um, hey, Bitta, this is your time check. You have three minutes. Oh, great. Um, so, and lastly, I wanted to just kind of touch on um, feral horses and wildlife. I, I had the great privilege of directing the Navajo Nation Division of Natural Resources um, immediately prior to this position that I'm in. And what Fish and Wildlife taught me was that the wildlife can find water sources. They move around, they understand where um, water is providing. Regrettably, it means they may have to move off the reservation um, in order to find those water sources. But the group of animals that are incapable of finding water sources are what we call feral horses. Um, and I don't know how many of you are aware that feral horses is a challenge in much of the West. Um, these are large animals that travel in packs and, and erode the surface. And so these animals have suffered greatly with the drought because they don't have the natural instincts that wildlife do to find um, to find wild water sources. So again, just sort of trying to pull together for you all listening today, how water is really at the heart of not just the Navajo Nation's existence, but all of humankind's existence. Um, and as we go into, uh, and as we work our way through this drought scenario, I, and this comment is really meant for next week, but I wanted to foreshadow it. I, I agree with Deanne that you know we can work through these issues. I think what's fascinating is that we're working through them in a time of COVID-19, in a time where we're talking about equity in a way that we've never um, discussed before. So thank you for this time. I hope I was able to give you some insight into how drought's affecting the Navajo Nation. And um, I look forward to any questions. Thank you so, so much, Beda.
Um, at this time, I'd like to invite all of our panelists um, that are able to turn on their camera um, to do so, uh, to participate in uh, some Q&A. Um, I'm going to start out of the gate with a question for you, Deanna, from the audience, which is, how is population growth and projected growth in Arizona impacting CAP planning for the future? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, so I would like to point out that the population growth in Arizona has, has I think, seven times over since, I'll say, the 1950s. Um, however, our water use has gone down overall. So the conservation efforts that are being done by our municipal providers, um, and uh, the thing is, is that CAP uh, cannot mandate conservation or things like that uh, that tie directly to population growth. But however, the uh, we do participate in conservation and support that conservation by the municipalities. Um, so that's that's how we participate in that. And we certainly do plan for it um, in, in our demands. However, we are mostly tied now to um, how much is available to us through the DCP um, and the different cuts. Thank you. Um, we also have a question for uh, Terry. Um, sorry, I had it up here. One second, let me grab it. Really fast. Okay, Terry, a question from the audience. Does the size of the farm operation correspond to an individual's ability to prepare and adapt to drought? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think I'm sure there's variability in that depending on, you know, where and the, what the situation and the conditions are with individuals. But I, I would say yes. I think that as with many businesses, we see um, consolidation and, and increase in size and or we see decrease inside the middle of our industries are all shrinking and a lot of that has to do with the ability to withstand and bear um, situations that are beyond their control or scope or, or or even their planning so larger operations i think have a better sense of durability because they have an ability to put reserves aside in some cases and be able to withstand these sorts of events. They also might have greater flexibility in land and water use uh, that's available to them, the ability to afford enhanced technology and things like that. So yes, I do think there is, there is relevance to that question. And I think as we scale resiliency and response, we have to take that into consideration. Great. Um, this question is for all of the panelists, um, but I would love to, to start with Bitta, so I'll put you on notice here. What coordination is needed that is not already happening to support drought response efforts? So from my vantage point at the Navajo Nation, you know, we um, are located in three states, or I like to say three states are located in the Navajo Nation. And, you know, nature knows no boundaries. So I think that there could be greater coordination um, by the states, but let me say it this way. Uh, and I get that everybody's um, overburdened, under-resourced. I think some regional, strategic regional planning that that does that is not bound to legal legal lines that nature doesn't see would be would be very helpful in certain parts of of the west and let me be very clear um when up in the northwest new mexico it, you know 20 years ago they started working on shortage sharing agreements on the san juan river right that's the kind of thing you know if you could move those sort of agreements at a more local level so deanna was talking about the state of arizona working statewide which is wonderful that's a huge landmass, and then the states. But how do you bring that down so that, like, your ranchers feel the impact, right, or your municipal water systems feel that coordination? I think that's something that that I think could be greatly improved. Okay. How about um, Deanna or Terry? Did you want to take a take a shot at answering that question from your perspective? You want to go ahead, Terry, or? 
I have some comments too. Okay. <laughs> um, it, I find it a little bit hard to, to answer that one because my initial response is that there is so much coordination already happening. I mean, all of those agreements that I talked about are happening at the multi-state level, the binational level, um, but certainly, as, as Vida pointed out, that, I mean, there needs to be more um, and there will be um, in order to get through uh, the next few years. The, the 2007 guidelines that I mentioned will expire at the end of 2026. And so we need to have something in place to replace that. So those uh, discussions have already started. Um, but certainly one thing that I've noted is that, I mean, I would always take more data. I mean, if we could have more funding to have consistent and more <laughs> data of uh, what's happening um, with our, our system, the, the river, the, the flows, um, the, the weather, the, I mean, all of that, that's what I would say. Um, I will say that there has been some money um, identified by the, the federal government, the Bureau of Reclamation has put some money forward uh, as drought response. Um, it may not be um, that federal drought response that Terry had, had talked about, um, but they are making funds available to, to put additional programs in place. Yes, so. okay. And Terry, I'll give you the last word before I close this Q&A out. Yeah, I do. I, I think probably some better, more enhanced coordination is probably necessary, but it's kind of the old the old notion and the old adage that you know we may have all the resources and all the elements available to us that we that we need we just aren't sort of consistent and applied and outcome based in our approach so i think some of that bears standing back uh, when it's not during a significant drought and actually trying to determine if we did it right the last time and we're prepared for the next time would be my would be my comment. Great. Good. Well, thank you again, Bitta and Terry and Deanna for your time and for your presentations. 